Thank you, Lord. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. I just want to read that quickly this morning. Of Philippians chapter 3, from verse 10 to 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. And if by any means that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I'll read that again because I just want you to follow me this morning. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. And if by any means that I might attain unto the resurrection of the death, that I may know him, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection this is all that I am interested in. This is Apostle Paul, the structural builder of the church of Christ Jesus, and was saying this. And this was over 10 years after he had this divine encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. He had met with the Lord. He had had that, 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 that dynamic encounter that many of us wish for in our lifetime. He saw Jesus for the first time physically on the way to Damascus. And I used to say this to people, and I said the first open air crusade that was ever organized was organized by Jesus for one person alone. He had one mission in mind, one soul in mind, Saul of Tarsus. That was all God was interested in that day. Of all the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in Israel that day, only one man caught the attention of heaven, and that was Paul of Tarsus. And God organized this open air crusade or outreach, whatever you want to call it, a campaign a revival meeting just to get this man's attention. And he did, got his attention. He got his attention. And that changed his life dramatically. And he started this journey that he upset the kingdom of darkness by that divine encounter. Man, but this was a man who had these supernatural manifestations of the power of God. And yes, later came out crying to us that I still want to know him. There is an aspect of him that I don't know yet. I want to know him. Paul, what do you mean by that? Didn't you meet with him on the way to Damascus? Have you not been preaching in his name? Have you not been performing signs and wonders and miracles in the name of this man? How can you say you still want to know him? That's a million dollar question to you and to me. But Paul was saying, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to understand the reason why God came in human flesh, died a brutal death, buried and decided to come forth on the third day. Why did he have to go through all that to save mankind? Why didn't he just do it with just a spoken word, because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and there was gross darkness over the surface of the deep in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be, and there was. Why didn't God just say, let man be saved? Why did he have to go through all that? This was a question in the heart of Paul, and I believe that we ask that question every now and again. Why didn't God just do that? Why didn't he just speak salvation into existence like he spoke the sun and the moon and the trees and the stars into existence? Why did he have to die? I want to know why. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. So this question became the platform of his hunger and his search That having miracles and signs and wonders as wonderful as they are is not enough. We need to know him. We need to know him. And the reason why I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to talk about this day, and, and we look at a message like this, and this is where it becomes, we become too religious for the comfort of heaven sometimes. And we want to talk about resurrection on Easter Sunday, Right? So this should have been last Sunday. 
but they're wrong. But because resurrection, the reason why we have not experienced or we are not walking in that supernatural dynamic power of the resurrected Christ that is meant to be for every child of God is because that which is meant to be life unto you and to me have been played down by the church. And so we think that the only time we talk about this is on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Weekend. No, it's an everyday thing. Because the truth is this, the resurrection is not an event. You can write this down. I want to talk to you this morning, and I want you to think, because this is where, this is the crux of your salvation and my salvation and the ability to walk in victory. The resurrection is not an event. It's not a place. It's not an Easter Sunday story. It's not an event. It's not a place. The resurrection is a person. Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25, he said, what? I am the resurrection. I am the life. So the resurrection is not an event. It's not an event to be talked about only on Easter Sunday. It's not a place. It's not a location in Jerusalem, somewhere in Jerusalem where the tomb goes and we go on pilgrimage. No, no, no. The resurrection is not about a place. It's not about event. It's about a person. And he said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. I want to know him. I want to know this person who is the resurrection. The resurrection means to, to, to raise up, to stand up straight, or to stand up again. It's originally taken from a Greek word, anesthesia, whatever they want to call it. I don't know. I can't pronounce it very well. But that is what it means. And, and this when we talk about the resurrection, knowing the power of the resurrected Christ, Paul said, I want to experience this. Because the resurrection is not an event. It's not a place. It's a person. You may forget anything else in your Christian race. Never forget that today. That when you understand what the resurrection means and what the resurrection story is all about, why the resurrection became a necessity for you and for me. That is not an Easter story. It's an ongoing, everyday story. Anytime you want to upset the system as it is, if you want to upset the kingdom of darkness as we know it for the then begin to talk about the resurrection power. They don't want to know that. They don't want you to talk about it. The Bible says, Paul again speaking to the church in Corinth, he said, if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory because if they had understood that this one they are doing is not just an event, it's not going to be a show to be remembered once in a lifetime. It's an everyday occurrence that will put the final blow to the kingdom of darkness. He said, if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they had known, if they had known that this is not just going to be an event in history, they would have left him alone. Because the resurrection is the power of God. So he said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. In Psalm 62, verse 11, you know, David speaking, he said, once has I spoken, twice have I heard that all power belongs to God. Jesus is that power. Paul speaking again to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 24. He said, this Christ Jesus is the wisdom and the power of God. The resurrected Christ. And so Paul said, I want to know him. And this power that made him indestructible. That power that conquers death. That power that grave cannot contain. I want to know that power. 
And I want to also attain to that. You see the sequence of events. You see the desire, what drove Paul. He didn't just want to know it. He didn't want to just have a, a theological experience or knowledge so that he can talk about it. He wants to walk in the resurrected power of Christ Jesus, which is available to you and to me. Because the resurrection power gives power to the death. Jesus speaking, he said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. If anyone believes in me, even though he is dead, he will come back to life. So Paul said, if you understand this power, if you understand this person, death will lose his grip over you and me. We see that discourse in John chapter 11 over the death of his friend Lazarus. This power that Paul was talking about, was crying about, is a power that, can, that turns impotent situation to potent. It's the power that confronts, because the Bible calls him the omnipotent God. Is he not? He's all powerful. And so when he's confronted with omnipotent situation, the Bible says there was a man in the book of John, chapter 5. There are two stories there that, 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 that attested to the power of the resurrected Christ. The reason why it's not an event and it's not a place is before, even before his death, he has already been risen. The Bible says he was crucified before the foundation of the earth. Is he not? Is that not what the Bible said? He was crucified before the foundation of the world was laid. The Bible also said him speaking himself to us in the book, in the gospel, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, before, the Bible said the night before he was betrayed. Right? The night before he was betrayed. Before he went to the cross, he went there in the spirit. Before, the night before he was betrayed, he took bread and wine. And he said, this is my body broken for you. In John chapter 8, he said, no man take my life away from me. Right? He said, I have the power to lay it down and the power to lift it up again. He said, this commandment have I received from my father. And so we are not talking about event here. We're talking about a person who is the embed, uh, uh, um, uh, embodiment of the power of God and the glory of God. He was a carrier of the power. And so it has nothing to do with the Roman soldier and their nails. And here was Jesus. And so Paul was crying out for that experience. So in John chapter 5, we saw the Bible said there were from verse 1, and there was a pool called Bersidia, and there was this impotent man who's been there all his life, seeking for help, and there was no one to help him. But when the resurrected life appeared at the scene, Jesus said, what? Do you want to be made whole? And he was talking, giving all the stories of his life. Jesus, I'm not interested in your history. I just want to solve the problem now. Do you want it now? Because you are important. But there is a, I, I'm a carrier of the resurrected life. And I can, resurrect it and I can resurrect anything that is dead in you now. Do you want this power? And Jesus said, rise. And straightway he began to make up his bed. In Acts chapter 3, we saw the same manifestation of the resurrected power. And this one now, the ones who have contracted that power, Peter and John, the Bible said they were going out 9 o'clock in, uh, in the hour of prayer. And they came to this gate called Beautiful. Something good in something bad. Here was a man crippled, impotent all his life, by the gate called Beautiful. And when he saw Peter and John coming to them, he was looking at them, but they were different from every other person that had been coming to that temple that day. There was something about them that was attractive. Because when you carry the resurrected glory in you, you are attractive. The glory of God cannot be hidden. It's contagious. And when, they, when he saw them, the Bible says he fixed his eyes on them. And they looked at him. 
And Peter turned around and said, look at us. He said, silver and gold we have none to give you. But we carry something that is so potent that can make your impotent situation history right now. Do you want that? In the name of the resurrected one, Christ of God. Because it's not an event. It's a person. And it's ever present wherever he's needed. And when they said in the name of Jesus, that they, and they lifted him up, the resurrection began to walk in that man's life. That is resurrection. To stand up straight again. Have you been broken down by the situations of life? Are you crippled right now spiritually, financially, materially? I don't know where you have been beaten down like the man by the pool. The resurrected life comes to make you stand up again. That is what it means, to stand up again. To the one who has fallen down in the feet, to stand up again. To the one who has been destroyed by sickness, crippled on the hospital bed, the resurrection life means to come unto you so that you can stand again. He came to give life. In Romans chapter 8 verse 11, he said, if the, if the same spirit <laughs> it's not an event, people of God. It's not a place. It's a person. If the same spirit, not a different one, that raised him from the dead, if that same spirit is in you, this is why the Holy Spirit is dangerous and is a pity that you and I can be carriers of power and still be walking you need to activate that inside of you I need to activate that he said if the same spirit not a different one the Bible said we all have received of the same spirit if the same spirit not a different spirit if you have a different spirit that is not of him, then we can talk about that. But if the same spirit that raised him from the dead, if that same spirit is in you, if it dwells in you, to dwell means to stay indefinitely. Permanent state of residence, to dwell. You see, if that same spirit dwells in you, that same spirit, because the same spirit is a resurrected spirit, is a power spirit. You see, that same spirit will quicken your mortal body. He gives life. Give life to you. He will give life to me. And because... The resurrection is not an event and it's not a place. It is not limited by distance, space, or time. It's not limited to space, nor time. Because if it is, then we're in trouble. Then the only time we can experience it is to go to the tomb where he resurrected from. If it's only limited to that event, then we have to wait forever. And the funny thing is that Easter used to be every April. Now they celebrated it in March, and that really threw me off my everything that I know. Amen. Because I was looking for it in April, and then it came in March. And so when, if we're expecting him, and said so the only time we're going to see the move of the resurrected Christ, because it's an event, then we are in trouble. But it's not limited to time, no distance, no space, no time. It's not containable. You can't contain the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the spirit of resurrection. And so the Bible says in Psalm 107, verse 20, I believe, he sent forth his word. No distance. No space. 
No time. He sent forth the word. We don't even know where he sent it to. But he just sent forth his word. And he just released it into the atmosphere because he's the master of the space and atmosphere. So he sent forth his word. And the word healed them. That means he was just doing retail healing. Amen. Also just release it and say everybody just receive. And he said, he, he not healed him, he healed them and delivered them from their what? Destruction. He sent it forth. And he delivers them. In Psalm 147, verse 15, I saw that this morning, and that just kind of blew me. I love the King James Version of this translation. I wrote it down here to read it. He sent forth his commandment. That is his word upon the earth, and his word runneth swiftly. That means there is speed. The speed of lightning, when it is released here, it answers in South Africa, distance notwithstanding. When the word is released right now, it will answer in Toronto, distance notwithstanding now, because it runs swiftly. You say, in a flash, in a twinkle of an eye, that is the speed of the word of God. That is the power of resurrection. And because the resurrection power is so powerful and potent, it's not intimidated by your situation. It's not intimidated by my situation. Look at Lazarus. When he came to that grave in John chapter 11, you can read that story again and again. And you will find new things every day you read that story. I can tell you that. And they said to Jesus, by this time, he stinketh. It's hopeless. Right? There's nothing you can do about that situation. Are you in that place right now of complete hopelessness? Men have given up on you. And now you have even given up on yourself. You have completely given up. There is no hope. There is no need anymore. We are waiting for death to come. They said unto Jesus, by this time is thinking. But Jesus is not intimidated by my problem. The resurrection power is the potent power of God that is not intimidated by the circumstances that you are in right now. It's not intimidated by cancer. That's what Jesus said. Do you believe that I am who I said I am? I am the resurrection. Now he said that before he rose from the grave. You know that, don't you and I know that? He said that before he went to the cross. Because if the resurrection was an event, Jesus, how dare you utter that that you've not even died yet? But he already died before he died. But he stood there and said, listen, I am uh, the embodiment of resurrection and nothing intimidates me. And so when he came to the tomb and they said, he's been dead for four days. And Jesus is standing before the tomb of your life. No, what, is it your marriage? Is it your finances? Is it your children? Whatever situation that the enemy has locked up and said, there is no hope again for you. Jesus is not intimidated by that. The doctors may be intimidated by the prognosis of your sick, your, 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 your report and the case before them. Your bank balance may intimidate you. But Jesus is not intimidated by that. He's not intimidated by our situation. He's not intimidated. And the good thing about knowing that the resurrection is not an event, nor a place. That makes it possible for me to know that the resurrection power can function, can function anywhere, anytime is invoked. It functions anywhere. In the book of Mark chapter 7, or Luke chapter 7, I believe, Sorry about that. Luke chapter 7. There was a widow that had come to the end of the road. Her only son 
was dead. And they were on the way to bury him. <laughs> and in the middle of nowhere, the resurrection intercepted the situation. And he came there and he said to the woman, weep not, I have come. And Jesus is saying to somebody here this morning, I'm here. He said, weep not, weep not, weep not. And the resurrection power, the Bible says he just touched the bear or the casket. And he said, arise. And he that was being taken to burial, instead of having a burial, funeral service, he turned toward a thanksgiving service. Whatever has been killed in your home, that the enemy is waiting for you to have a funeral service, I decree in the name of Jesus, may that same resurrection power that intercepted that woman's situation before it became too late, God will also intercept your situation and turn your mourning into dancing in the name of Jesus. That is the man we're talking about this morning. And as we look at Paul crying. You see, the bad, wicked thing about the devil is that when he blinds me up with ignorance, he hides the truth from me so that he can continue. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They are destroyed because they don't know. They are destroyed because they don't know the truth. So Jesus says in John chapter 8, I believe, and 32, he said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth is what brings liberty and freedom. It is that knowledge that Paul was crying for in Philippians chapter 3. It's not just having that head knowledge. It is the knowing that comes through revelation. That becomes that, and you become the walking embodiment of the word that you know. It is that truth that liberates you. It is that truth that brings you freedom. It is that truth that breaks the power of the devil over your life. Because the, the mission of the devil is to distort the truth and to rewrite the story of your life negatively. Now, do you know? That the word Lazarus simply means the one whom God helps. That is the meaning of his name. And that is who you are. When God saved you, you become a candidate for God's help. But the one who is supposed to be helped by God is now helpless in the grave. The enemy was trying to change his name. The enemy buried that destiny to say, let us see how God will help you. Lazarus means, God helps me. And now there is no God to help him. And you know the story. And they say, this man that loved this one so much, why couldn't he keep him from dying? The one whom you love, that you are meant to help, has just lost his job. Can you do something about it? And there is no answer from heaven. But I thought you say God is your helper. I thought you say God is your helper. I thought you said you serve a living God. I thought you told me that your God is all powerful. I thought you told me yesterday that there is nothing too hard for God to do for you. I thought you just told me that your life is hidden in Christ and Christ in God, that the enemy cannot assess you. Lazarus, where is the help now? When the helper becomes helpless. What do you do? Because the mission of the devil is to try to distort the truth about your destiny. Even though God has said to you concerning your children, 
You see, he, the Bible says, you and the children that God has given you, they are meant for signs and for wonders. In Jeremiah 29, 11, we all know that. I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. The plan of good and not of evil, to give you hope and a future, to bring you to your expected end. But this is not what I expected when I started out in this marriage five years ago. This was what I expected when I gave birth to this baby 20 years ago. This was not my expectation. Where is the promises of God to me? Now, it's in the grave. The enemy was determined to make a mockery of the destiny of Lazarus. But thank God, the resurrection and the life was nearby. And it's closer to you than you think this morning. Because the mission of the resurrection power that Paul was crying about is to rearrange every negative situation about you. Just like Lazarus' situation was rearranged by the appearance of the resurrected Christ. Isaiah 14 verse 27 said, For the Lord of hosts has purpose and he will not annul it. His hand is stretched out and he will not turn back. His hand has been stretched out so that he can turn around everything to undo everything that the enemy has done against you and your family. He comes to change the negative order of things. And we must look to him. The resurrection power that Paul was crying about, the reason why he wanted that is because he knows that the only way grace and great grace can be released is through the resurrection power. So the resurrection power releases great grace upon God's children. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection and the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Because every time the resurrection power is invoked, grace is released. And that's why the enemy doesn't want us to talk about it, doesn't want us to emphasize on it. We can preach motivational thought, we can talk, but when we begin to talk about the Christ of God and the resurrection power, because that is where grace is released. And this is why talking about resurrection power makes him mad. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 verse 2, we say that being grieved that they touch the people and preach through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Because the enemy knows that the only thing that can disarm him, the only thing that can rearrange your destiny and my destiny, the only thing that can give power back to the crippled situation in your life is the resurrection power of Christ. So he gets angry when this truth is being projected out. And he said he got angry. In Acts chapter 4 verse 2, he said they were angry. Every now and again, when they talk about other things, nobody got angry, but when the resurrection until date if you want to make the world mad, tell them that Jesus is risen from the dead. And they get angry. Because the enemy does not want you to know that code. He doesn't want you to have that knowledge. Because if the same spirit that resurrected him from the grave, that raised him from the grave, if that same spirit is in you, that understanding is in you, it will quicken you back to life. It will bring you out of your grave into life again. It will stop the finger of that over your life. Listen to me, child of God. It is possible. Jesus wants us to walk in that resurrection power. Paul said, if it is possible, I want also to attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I said, I want to, I want to. That is my desire. Now I know. Towards the end of his ministry, Paul began to tell us 
give us a glimpse of what he now know. In one of the letters to Timothy, he said, I now know whom I believe. <laughs> he said, and I know that he's able to keep that which I've entrusted to him until that day. In one of the letters towards the end, the letter to the earth of apostles, he said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified because I now know. I cried for that understanding. I wanted to experience it. Now I have. And I can tell you without any shadow of doubt, church, this was Paul talking to us. He said, I now know whom I believe that is able to keep anything that is entrusted into his hand. That when the, that the restoration power, it is possible, you can experience it. And that is the desire of God for you and for me. He wants you and me to walk in that knowing, in that power. And the only way we can know and walk in that is when we get rid of that theology that makes us think about it as an event in history. No. He's a person. And quickly this morning, I just want to give you five points, not all, how to get and how to experience the resurrection power. How you can. The first thing we see, that the resurrection power is activated through knowing him. You must know him. You must know him first. Paul said that I may know him. First, I want to know him. Because if I know him, then I will know the power of his resurrection. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It is in the knowing of who Jesus is. That question, do you know him? Or you know about him? Daniel says, when wicked men begin to do wickedly in the land, those who know their God, not those who talk about their God, because you can talk about him and don't know him. You can sing about him and don't know him. You can write letters about him. You can write books about him and still don't know him. He said, those who know him will be strong and do exploit. So the first criteria, the first foundation is that I need to know him. And when I know him, I will believe in him. The reason why we don't believe in him is because we don't know him. We think we do. Because if you know who Jesus is, you will believe in him. Because the second thing that is, is made possible through believing, in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, you see, if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and shall believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, there you shall be saved. And if I believe in him, what is required of me to begin to experience the resurrection life is easy for me to apply. Right? First, the third thing is, in sequence, is that I die so that I can live. Amen. Because for you to experience, if you, for, for me to be raised up, I have to be down. Is that not true? For Lazarus to come back to life, he has to die first. Amen. And so I have to die to myself. It is in my dying that the resurrection life is released. Romans 6, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. It is in dying to me that his life is released through me. So Paul, who understood this, says again, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he said, it is no longer I that live it. I have been crucified with Christ. I died. When I understood what it means to attain to the resurrection experience, to experience the resurrection power, 
I have to die. So I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live it, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. And when I'm dead to myself, then the fourth experience is easy. Living holy. Living holy unto the Lord. Because dead men cannot get angry. Amen. Have you ever seen a dead man angry? If dead men get angry, we'll be running away from funerals every day. Amen. <laughs> and uh, even though we, we have this belief that they can see us and hear us, and so that's why they say you don't speak ill of the dead, because we have this thing in our head that they can hear. They don't hear nothing. Amen. They can't see you. They can't do nothing. When they're dead, they're dead. Amen. They're gone. They can't get, you can't see, an, you see a dead man angry, then we're in trouble. Amen. If you see a dead man hungry, then you're in trouble. Have you seen a dead man lost in, you know, can you come to his funeral and he's looking at that lady and said, oh boy, why did I die so soon? <laughs> dead men don't have any form, any carnal reaction. So it's easy to live holy. So the resurrection power is activated through holy living. Romans chapter 1 verse 4, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And finally, this morning, resurrection power, you can be empowered to live, it empowers you to live in righteousness because God wants you to reign here on earth for him. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him. You want to reign? What resurrection power do you empowers you and enables you, puts you in a position to reign as princes and priests of God? To reign as a priest means you become the oracle of God. Is that not what a priest does? You go to the priest. For those of us who come from Africa, you know what the high priest, you go to him. I'm a priest right now in the house of God. When we, when we talk about priests, we can relate to them. You go to them and they pour libation and they tell you about, you know, they, they, they are the most feared men in the village. Amen. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, the high priest is the most revered man. When you say that man is the priest of the gods, you, you don't go near him. You know, and it's like, it's, 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 it's a masquerade. You, you don't, it's mysterious. And, and you don't want to cross his path. You, you are afraid of him. And the Bible said we will reign as priest of God. The resurrection power makes you untouchable. The word revere you because the glory of God, because when you become a carrier of the resurrection power, the devil can't touch you. How can you kill what is already dead? Anyway, amen. <laughs> and I was thinking about it the, the other night. I said, the, the, what we fear the most is death. And I say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death has been conquered. I was reading an article. That got me thinking. And a, a pastor was threatening a politician. And they said, he's going to die. And the man said, okay, well, he said, and, and, and this is an unbeliever. And he said something that just put a revelation in my head yesterday evening. And he said, we are all going to die. It just depends on when. So why will you threaten me with death? Because we Christians are more afraid of death than the unbeliever sometimes. Now let's say it. We are the only visitors that want, don't want to go back home. Amen. And that's why it's hard for people to believe us. Amen. We are the only guests. We are the only people who go on vacation and don't want to go back to our houses anymore. And so the world is looking at us and you're telling me to believe. You know, they say, oh, this world is not our home. No, it's your home. The way you live, you don't live like somebody who is just passing through. When you really begin to live with eternity in mind, you don't have to say too much. People will listen. If your value 
And so, and I realized that, why should I be threatening my enemy with death? Death is cheap. Everybody's going to die. It's where I'm going to go after death that is more important. We are all going. And the man said, we are all going to die. It depends on when. So why would you threaten me that if I don't do this, I will die? I'm not afraid of death. Because you that is threatening somebody else with death is because you're afraid of death. You think death is so powerful. And that is why it intimidates you and me. We've given so much power to that which has already been conquered by the Lord. Jesus said, oh, death, where is your sting? That has been conquered. Why should that which has been conquered continue to intimidate you and me? And we're so fearful. The Bible says, perfect love cast away fear. And fear becomes a snare. And we are grappling with it. But this morning, there's a resurrection power that God wants to release to you and to me. That want to rewrite every pain that the enemy has done this morning, this is what I want us to do. Courage put Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 in King James Version. Now, this is what I feel so strong in my spirit. And as we're going to pray this morning to go, and I pray and I beg you to stand upon the scripture as you begin to plead for the same thing cried the same way Paul cried, I want to know him. Because the power of resurrection is what we need. Now the Bible says, this is my prayer point this morning. I'm saying all this to bring us to this point today as we go. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances in one translation that stood opposed to us. That is to say, what the resurrection power came to do. The Bible says, as we keep looking at our scripture, Jesus is the author and the what? Finisher of our faith. That is to say, everything that has been written that is contrary to the plan and the purpose of God for your life and to my life. Jeremiah 29, 11, that you and I know so much. I know the plans that I have for you. They are what? Of good and not of evil. To give you what? A hope and a future. To bring you to your ex what? expected end. But something came up and begin to rewrite that story of your life. Every handwriting that has been, the enemy came and altered the story of your destiny. 20 years ago, if somebody told you this is the way your life is going to be, you would never have believed them. You dreamt something better. You saw something greater than this. If somebody told you, this is the way your children are going to be. No, 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 no. You didn't see that. What you saw then is what it is and what should be. But the enemy came and what? And tried to rewrite the scripts and tried to change the story. He changed the story of your family. The marriage that started so well a good story. Three years down the line, suddenly, he came and started writing a new script that is now contrary to you. That's what the Bible said. Back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, as we pray. That is against you. One translation said that was against us. That is standing in opposition to you. He came. Right? and took it out of the way. Resurrection power, nailing it to the cross. 
resurrection power. So he came. So the Bible may call him the author and the what? Finisher of your faith. So what he did was that he took that evil scripts that came to distort the faith. And he said, no, that story has not ended yet. And so the story of your life is not finished yet because the author has not written anything yet. And so now he's saying, when you understand the resurrection power, I would take that script that came to distort that. Now I want to finish the story the way it should be. This is the way the end should be. Your end, you see, your later end shall be what? Greater than the former. See, he that has begun the good work in you will complete it. And so God, I started something, but somewhere along the line, the enemy came and was trying to change your story. But I have come to change that. Nailing it to the cross. Making what? A public show of them in verse 15. And triumphing over them by the cross. Resurrection power. He triumphed over them, resurrected, nailed them, and made a public show of them. Everything that has come to disgrace you, God wants to disgrace them. And this is resurrection. This is what it means to have the resurrection power. You see, I want to blot it out. And I don't know what scripts. It's been written against you. I don't know how the story of your life has changed. I don't know how bad the story is right now. You know I don't know, but he knows. And he said, I want to take it out of the way. I want to create a resurrection for you so that I can begin to write a new story. Let us continue with the dream. Why do I know that? Paul, who understood this, said to us in the book of Ephesians, he said, to him that is able to do abundantly above all that you can ever think or imagine. Any part of your life that is not in the dream, that you have not imagined, he said, to him that is able to do abundantly above all that you and I can ever think or imagine according to the power that is what? At work within us. Resurrection power. He said he can, he can rearrange that story again. It is possible only through the resurrection power. Can you just bow your head right now and begin to talk to God? Begin to talk to God about your story that has been distorted. Let it be blotted out right now. This is what resurrection is all about. So that you can rise again. The story that has crippled you. You can rise again. That story that has distorted your journey. And now something good is something bad. Beautiful has become ugly. Happy has become sad. Good has become bad. That story can change again. He can blot it out. Let him see the handwriting of ordinances against you. That writing, that whatever the enemy has written, the scripts that he's written concerning your marriage, that you have been acting out, and that is not the plan you had. This was not what I planned when I got married five years ago. You, you will hear people say that. This was one of, this is what, I, I wasn't expecting this when I moved to Grand Cash five years ago. I wasn't, this was not what I was expecting when, when my child went to college. No, I had high hope and expectation, but that hope and expectation can still become a reality. The resurrection power came to rearrange what the enemy has disorganized. Tell him that right now. Let the resurrection power be applied. Apply the resurrection power, Lord. Tell him that situation in your life right now that has been rearranged by the devil. Let the Lord make a public show of them. Let them triumph over him right now for you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Talk to God this morning, child of God. Talk to God this morning. Talk to God this morning.
talk to God this morning. Talk to God about your situation. Let the resurrection power, let that earthquake take place right now. Let the order of things change for your own good. Every script that, that has been written for your children, rewrite it right now. Let that script be nailed to the cross right now. By the blood of Jesus that created the revolution and resurrection power, let it be blotted out, let it be cleansed out. And so that the author can begin to write the story. To continue from where it stopped, where it changed, where it bended. Talk to God about it this morning. In the name of Jesus. Is it your health that has been rewritten wrongly? The doctor's report. Is it a statement from the bank? Every hard writing is nailed right now, blotted out. Any writing that is contrary, any script that is contrary to your purpose in life, that the enemy is trying to make a mess of your destiny and make a mockery of you and your children because... Holy Ghost. Oh, Jehovah God. Move in the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray for this once this morning. Let the resurrection power, Lord, I invoke that resurrection power on behalf of every family represented here. May the same spirit that resurrected you from the grave, may that same spirit, O oh God, begin to quicken every body, mortal body, quicken them out of sickness, quicken their marriage out of despair, quicken their children out of drug addiction and, and, and rebellion. In the name of Jesus. May that same spirit that raised you from the dead, O oh God, that, that, that distance notwithstanding, the resurrection is not an event, it is you, and you are here right now. So, Father God, we ask, so God, let that same power be activated right now. And the Bible says, and your power was present. Lord, we activate that same power on behalf of anyone here, O oh God, that need, O oh God, their story rewritten in the name of Jesus. Rewrite it, O oh God. Blot out every handwriting of ordinances that is contrary to the purpose of God for their life. Everything that is working against their marriage, against their finances, against their children, against their health, against their job, against their future, against their destiny. In the name of Jesus, let the power of resurrection Begin to walk on your behalf in the name of Jesus. May heavens rattle every grave that your destiny has been buried in. In the name of Jesus. It's never too late. It's never too late. You're never too old. In the name of Jesus. It cannot be too bad for God not to intervene. Man may be intimidated by that situation because it's been gone for too long. The doctors may be helpless because they are intimidated by the prognosis. But there is a God that is not intimidated. That resurrection power that is not intimidated by any situation. We ask, oh God, that you release it over that child, over that man, over this woman, over this man, over this home. In the name of Jesus, may they encounter that change. That only your power can release. Father, we give you praise. We bless your name. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. As you, before we go, there is a...
Uh, I want you to write the scripture down. I, I, I want you to stand on it and pray. And the Sunday will, will continue because mostly praying as we bring it out to experience the grace of the resurrected power. And I want you, you know, throughout this week and as long as you can, stand upon the scripture, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. And I read it now. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, having spoiled principalities and power, he made a public show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. God, you will triumph over everything that has been triumphing over me. You pray that way. Everything that has been working against me, Lord, that has brought shame and reproach or tried to bring shame and reproach to my family, to my child because of the situation. Father God, I bring it before the resurrection power and I ask so God let the power of God that can triumph over every situation. God, triumph over the situation for me. I cannot do it by my Myself. Lord, this situation that my child is in right now, this habit, this lifestyle, Lord, I have tried everything and nothing seems to be working, but I bring it before the resurrection power. Lord, triumph over the enemy on my behalf. Make a public show of them, the same way they have made a public show of me, the same way they have embarrassed me by this situation. Father God, you will embarrass them in the same way. You will show up on my behalf. As you begin to declare the counsel of God over your situation, refuse to accept defeat because the resurrection Christ is in you. Greater is he that is in you than that which is in the world. Father, we bless you today. We thank you for your word. Father God, as we step out here, we step out knowing that we are the carriers of the power of resurrection. Because you are not, you are the resurrection. And you are in us. And so we become the resurrected ones. Father, we thank you for this knowing. May we walk in this knowledge like never before. May the Lord bless and keep you this week. May this month be your resurrection month. In the name of Jesus. Go with God. God bless you. There is coffee.